Welcome to the Asset Revolution Podcast, where each week, your hosts from Arbor Digital provide educational opportunities for financial advisors and individual investors to gain knowledge in this emerging powerhouse that is digital asset investing. The Asset Revolution Podcast is your connection to the future of digital assets and an opportunity for anyone to get off zero. Let's dive in. Alrighty, uh, we are showing 12.02 Central Time for me, so that's 1.02 for everyone on the East Coast. Uh, we've got a few more coming in, so we're going to go ahead and kick this off and get started. So everybody, welcome to the webinar today, hosted by yours truly uh, at Arbor Digital in partnership with Digital Asset Research. My name is Mark Nichols, Product Director, and with me today we have Matthew Koleski, who is the Chief Compliance Officer and uh, co-owner of Arbor Capital Management, which is the uh, registered investment advisory firm where, where Arbor Digital lives under, as well as the co-founder of Arbor Digital. And then we also have Doug Schwenk, who is CEO of Digital Asset Research. So while, before we get into today's webinar, what I'd like to do is talk about how y'all can engage with us as we go through this, because we would like to hear from you just as much as you're going to hear from us today. So the first way you can get in touch with us is the Q&A box. Uh, we will be monitoring the, the questions and we do have time slated to get to any of those questions that come through. Um, and that's what we're gonna hope to spend at least 10 to 15 minutes uh, on your questions. The other way that you're gonna be able to engage with us, I'm gonna be releasing a poll before we get into. So it's just three quick questions. Um, and then once we get the answers for that, we'll share, we'll kind of go through the results and hopefully we'll have some findings from there. And then the other way, um, is that when you can engage with us after the webinar, we're going to show a, a screen at the end to how you can get in touch with us, should you want to meet or have any deeper questions about anything we go over today. Um, because while we do have an hour, we could spend 12 hours on each subject if we really wanted to. So with that being said, uh, I'd like to start kicking us off by going with a poll. So you're gonna see a poll with three question or two questions. One is your view on digital assets. Uh, so there are four options that you can choose from and you can pick one. The second question is kind of a word association. When someone says crypto, I think of X. Um, so I've got some options there uh, and then you can pick as many options as you can from the options we have there. So I'm gonna leave this up here for about 30 seconds to a minute. Uh, to get all the answers in. And then once I see we've got about at least 80% of the participants coming in uh, with answers, we'll go ahead and close the poll. Okay, I see we've got pretty much everyone there. I see some interesting answers. Uh, the good thing here is uh, I think a lot of the extreme answers that we put up here, I would say maybe a year ago, we would have gotten uh, a lot of answers for uh, are not the answers. Um, so that's great. So we're moving forward, we're progressing there. Well, thank you all for doing that. Uh, again, use the Q&A please to put any of your own questions that you wanna get answered as we go through. But let's go ahead and get started. So the first place we have to start, as with any financial webinar like this one, uh, is we have to start with some disclosures. So what I'd like to do is go over Arbor Digital is an SMA, or what's called a separately managed account, provider specializing in digital assets for independent financial advisory firms based in the U.S. Arbor Digital is a division of parent firm Arbor Capital Management, which is a registered investment advisory firm based in Anchorage, Alaska. Arbor Digital has, in, has engaged in an enterprise relationship with digital asset research to provide clean, accurate pricing and blockchain data to help us at Arbor Digital perform quality research on the industry, individual networks, and individual assets. We do also utilize digital asset research's digital asset industry taxonomy, which is still a mouthful for me, which is a comprehensive methodology 
for the classification of digital assets from industry to subsector, like we see in traditional assets today, based on their functional use cases. So today, as I mentioned before, you're going to be hearing from myself, Matt Kaleski, and Doug Schwenk. Oh, forgot the other ones. Uh, none of this is investment advice. Uh, past performance is not indicative of future results. All information and opinions presented in this webinar is subject to change. And we highly encourage you, if you have any more questions on uh, anything presented in this webinar, please reach out to us on an individual basis. Okay, moving on. So before we get into today's agenda, real quick, I know I've introduced Matt and Doug to you all, but Matt, Doug, I would love for you just to do a brief intro of yourself, uh, your background, and what we're going to talk about today. And Doug, I'll get, I'll get to you first. All right. So Doug Schwank, I'm the CEO of Digital Asset Research. Um, I come from a background in uh, traditional finance and fintech, uh, spent a career in the hedge fund space and in fintech um, and a few other things. Left that in um, 2009 after the financial crisis. Not as much fun to be in a hedge fund as it used to be. Um, then started a reg tech business, uh, ran that for about um, six years, uh, and then started digital asset research along with a crypto custodian um, called Digital Asset Custody Company. And so have been in prof professionally in crypto since 2017 and really focused on the needs of institutional clients in a couple of different um, ways. Wonderful. Thank you, Doug. Matt. Yeah, everybody. I'm Matt Koleski. Great to be here. Looking forward to this conversation. Um, and Mark mentioned I'm a compliance officer for Arbor Capital, which is a parent company of Arbor Digital. Um, I've been personally invested in digital assets for a little over a decade. And, and then we that that personal experience allowed us to bring that to Arbor Capital. Yeah, we're based in Alaska. We think a little differently because we're sitting out there on the edge and it kind of led us to explore this. And we're fiduciaries. And so what that means is we wanted to bring this new asset class to our people in the most responsible and the most secure way possible. And we started that process in about 2018 and has led us to launch Arbor Digital. And I'm excited for this conversation after a very uh, tumultuous 2022. So Mark, take it back to you. Well said. So without further ado, let's go ahead and start diving in. So today, what we're going to do are really two, three main things. And the first is going to be a quick run of the numbers. Now, this is going to be a little bit different than probably what you've seen in other webinars. Uh, so the first section we're going to talk about is adoption, which is very crucial to understanding this space. The second is the financial numbers. And those are your traditional numbers that you'll probably see on every other uh, webcast webinar on this topic. And then the third, which we feel is very, very important to hit on, are correlation numbers. And we've specifically segmented them out because that will be a hot topic coming in to 2023. Uh, and it has been a hot topic previously, but we'll probably be re-engaging because of so many different themes that we feel are gonna play out in this space. And then the second thing we're gonna do is review our four main themes that we think are gonna shape digital asset markets in 2023. And we'd love to end this with a Q&A from all the questions that you have for us and give specific time and space to answer those questions. So with that, Let's go into our quick dive of the numbers. So first you're gonna see up on the screen is adoption numbers. What does adoption mean? This simply put is, is anybody using it? How many people are using it? And what's the quality of usage? Because that's what we look at when we're looking at the networks or the tokens themselves. Um, because it's very, very fundamental to anybody's investment theses in this space. So what I'd like to, I've got three metrics that we look at. Uh, very closely. So the first is total addresses with a balance. That means there is a or there is a unique wallet address. And I say unique because there could be many, many different wallet addresses under one entity. Uh, so unique wallet addresses with a balance of said crypto. And this one is Bitcoin. So December 31st, 2020 or 2022, or actually 2021, sorry, that's a mistype there. Uh, of last year, we ended off the year at about roughly 39 million uh, wallets with that had a Bitcoin balance. We've actually grown to about 42 million now. So while it's not the exponential growth that we've seen over the last 10 years, 
it's good to know that even in the downturns and even what we saw, we saw some growth in wallets. And the same thing happened with Ethereum. And in fact, even more so. And we're going to talk a little bit more about how that, how and why we feel that happened. But you saw pretty good growth in active wallets with the balance on the Ethereum network. The other the other number that I'll go through is active addresses. That means a transaction was happened within a 24 hour period. So one thing that we saw that was very um, inspirational for us was that active addresses did not decline or did not decline along with prices. We saw active addresses in the same range. Now on the other side, we didn't see growth here, but that doesn't necessarily mean a bad thing. So we went from about average active addresses in a day to 700,000 to 720,000. So pretty roughly the same. Now, what that means is there's still people using the network and that's what's important. And the same thing with ETH. ETH, we saw the a pretty similar uh, happening with addresses remaining flat for the year. The last metric here for adoption that we look at is your seven day average of those transactions. So how many transactions are we seeing? Uh, so what we saw was pretty flat. We saw the same amount of transactions happening, even though we hit what we hit in 2023 or 2022. So with that, we do see different uh, pieces coming together when it comes to the adoption numbers. So now let's go to the, to the financial numbers. The financial numbers, again, you've all seen this before, and this is where nothing looks great. <laughs> we went from 2.3 trillion uh, from the crypto, the full crypto market cap to about 830 billion as of the end of this year. We went from decentralized finance total value locked from 166 billion to 39 billion. And keep in mind, these are dollar nominated. These are not uh, the crypto token. So it's not denominated in Ethereum or Bitcoin, which would be different numbers, but we tend to look at everything in dollar nominated because it's easier for everyone to understand. We went, the price statistics were obviously not in favor. We hit a huge downturn in prices this year. Um, we saw fees get hit very, very much so on the networks as well, uh, especially with Ethereum. Ethereum fees went from, you know, all-time highs to about 35 million at the end of last year to about 2.2 million a day uh, ending off uh, 2022. What was interesting, however, we saw was that Bitcoin dominance rose when many predicted that Bitcoin dominance would fall sharply in 2022. So something to pay attention to. The other thing is ETH dominance. ETH was flat. So ETH didn't take over more of the market share. Again, something that many have called for uh, in the industry. The last piece, and I'm gonna tap you up here, Doug, to talk a little bit about correlations. I think this is a, a topic that's very near and dear to you. One thing that we saw in 2022 with the big ties from crypto to the macro, we saw correlations rise very, very sharply, and that is a dislocation from what historically has happened between crypto or specifically Bitcoin and Ethereum and traditional assets. So, Doug, I'd love for you to, to kick it off here with giving us some insight into where do you think that comes from and what happened with correlate? What's the correlation story from 2022 that we should walk away with? I think there's a couple of different drivers of that uh, that correlation, and of course, um, as we've learned in capital markets over and over, things are uncorrelated until they're not. Um, you know, certainly learned that in 2008 and seven, and um, I think we saw it here again. Um, Bitcoin historically has been uncorrelated, uh, and crypto markets have historically been uncorrelated to traditional markets. That was a strong argument at the beginning of the pandemic for uh, some uh, institutional investors to um, invest in Bitcoin especially as money printing was happening um, at the federal level uh, in, in quite a few different jurisdictions. Um, we think that the, um, uh, the institutional clients who entered the space during the pandemic, as well as some easy money policies kind of drove people to buy Bitcoin and other digital assets in a, in a similar way that they were buying technology stocks. And we saw a pretty strong correlation to uh, technology stocks, and and um, as as those uh, technology stocks had a, had a sell off, uh, the crypto markets, especially the institutional clients, responded in similar ways. They were looking at these crypto assets as technology investments, at least in the way they were allocating risk in their portfolios. Um, the macro drivers here. 
especially with um, central banks, we think uh, will be will be shifting over the course of this um, uh, this year. And I think we're going to talk about that a little bit later. But we see that that um, you know these kinds of monetary policy driven um, correlations and risk on risk off uh, correlations may have some easing as as um, uh, we see inflation more under control than it was, and so backing off of some of the um, uh, some of the measures to combat inflation, and as we see the evolution of institutional interest in the space from um, being kind of just pure macro into now some other um, other more nuanced uh, approaches. Wonderful. Thank you for going into that. And one thing that I want to highlight about this slide and the reason why we put it in there too was you can start to see that this quarter, one of the, that this theme of we feel that correlations will uh, not follow the same path as they did in 2022, given a lot of the macro effects, um, we feel that that's going to play on. So we're, we're starting to see that again. It's a very, very small sample size where we're two weeks in, almost three weeks in, um, but we feel uh, with everything and along with what we're going to talk about after this that we will start to see this decoupling that many have actually called for in terms of correlation, which is going to part of the investment thesis on why an allocation, a small allocation to a traditional portfolio makes sense, especially uh, when you talk about uh, managing risk in a, in a portfolio, but still wanting to participate in the upside opportunity. So let's go in. Now, after that, we can start talking about the four main themes. So the first theme we have here is defining and segmenting the industry. So Matt, I'd love to kick this off to you and I'm gonna stop sharing my screen as we go through these so we can focus on us here. When you think about defining and segmenting the industry, what are some important things? How, why is that a theme that's gonna drive markets in 2023? Yeah, that's a good good way to kick it off and i just wanted to real quick touch on what doug just mentioned in, on the 2022 and some of the changing that's happening on the macro scale because it's really important um right we have easy money for a long time it was flowing into all these different asset classes with you know bond rates near zero and that's starting to change so a lot of money flowed into the digital asset space and a lot of it came to people that that's not necessarily should have been allocating capital properly and we're finding that out now. So that's really important. So tighter monetary policy, hopefully can clean some of that up. We're looking forward to regulation. But Mark, to your question in terms of um, the, the continued kind of maturation of this asset class, right? As it gets defined and categorized in new ways, I think is, is really important to help mature the overall asset. I just mean, this is exactly what Doug is uh, and his firm is helping to move the industry forward, right? We need to create these uh, boundaries for these new assets so people can contextualize them and say, okay, I know what a stock is, I know what uh, technology is, and I know what some of the subsectors are. Doug and his firm, they're applying the same kind of principles and methodology to the digital asset space. So it helps people engage with the asset class in ways that they're familiar with, which is really important. And again, because what we've seen in 2022 is not necessarily the best representation of what this asset class can be. And I think that's what, what gets us excited to be here when we talk about 2023 and some of the other things that we have on our list, like let's get these, get some of the bad actors out of it. Let's clean this up. And so that's a big part of, of why we're here and talking about this. Yeah, and one of the things that you've said a lot and that we, we've taken to heart here at Arbor Digital is um, the first distinction we had to make, and when we go out and, and help educate uh, not just advisors, but individual investors as well, is that there is actually there are actually two different crypto industries. And a lot of times they get lumped into one. We have the centralized digital asset industry, and then we have the decentralized digital asset industry. So I think one thing that you do a really good job at is making sure to say what is and what isn't decentralized versus centralized. So um, you, so for example, uh, Sam Bankford Freed and FTX, it's hard not to talk about digital assets without mentioning those names. Um, so are that, is that a centralized crypto? Is that part of the centralized crypto industry or the decentralized? Yeah, what you're, yeah, what you're getting at obviously is there's been a lot of these centralized entities and exchanges that in this case are mostly offshore and doing things with client funds that they shouldn't. So and what's getting caught up in a lot of this is 
and in, is the digital assets themselves and the blockchain technology is getting in, indicted along with people that are just honestly what turns might turn out to be a flat outright Ponzi scheme, right? Where they're taking client funds and doing bad things with them. That has nothing to do with the digital asset technology and blockchain technology at the fundamental core level. And so we need to create that separation and distinction. Let's leave all that in 2022, right? And let's focus on what is good about these assets and what some of the actual value accrual mechanisms that we're going to talk about a little, in a little bit, what that means and how to invest in those, not what bad actors are. I mean, human nature, right? It flows into every single asset class and we see it. And when it's unregulated and offshore, it just seems to magnify it. Throw in, right? The most volatile asset class we probably have ever seen. And it just makes it uh, far worse. But we just need to make that distinction, Mark, right? Centralized bad actors that lever themselves up and do bad things with client money. That's not what we're, that's not what the focus of this is, but you're right. We need to talk about it, but make the distinction. That's not what gets us excited about this asset class. Well said. And Matt, you mentioned some of the work that Doug and Digital Asset Research uh, has done in helping define uh, and segment the industry out. So uh, Doug, you've had a lot of wonderful uh, illuminating thoughts in helping separate uh, those line or helping create those boundaries and create those lines. Can you talk a little bit more about what you guys are seeing and what work y'all have done uh, to bring to, to help with that uh, initiative? Yeah, so I think well, I'll go back to um, what got me excited about um, digital assets and crypto in a very new way in 2016 and 17. And that was the idea that you could have a portfolio of these I had been following Bitcoin for a long time, and I believed that the success of Bitcoin would be about the network effect and the adoption of Bitcoin. But it's hard to know that you know one asset is going to rule the rule the world. And uh, by the way, the use case for Bitcoin is is maybe sort of narrowly defined, um, or the capabilities are narrowly defined. And then you have the rise of Ethereum, which brings smart contract platform. Uh, uh, concepts to crypto, you have these two main assets in um, in crypto, and you start to see the addition during that ICO boom of lots of other assets that have maybe unique use cases, maybe unique ways of solving problems. And, and I think this is very similar to what we see in maturity of technology and other, you know, in other spaces. We think about the maturity of the internet in the you know, mid and late 90s, or at least the beginnings of that um, of that mass adoption of the internet. And we have a lot of, of um, you know, you can't just rely on one company or one technology to solve all those problems. You couldn't just buy Netscape and be done. Um, when we look at the digital asset space today, we're tracking about 10,000 different um, crypto assets, um, which is a huge number. Um, we have categorized uh, 1,300 of them by sector, super sector, and subsector, and by themes in a way similar to, um, uh, to GIX or ICB and traditional assets that can tell you, here's a group of assets that are designed to solve a slightly different problem, whether that's stable coins, whether that's asset backed uh, for, for other, you know, like gold backed uh, coins whether that's a um, smart contract platform, uh, whether that's a gaming token, you have all these different uses of what can be uh, different crypto assets. And one of our goals is to help categorize the space. So as people want to build diversified portfolios and take a bet, maybe you're a big believer and you want to, uh, you know, maybe one of your investment themes is GameFi. You see the use of digital tokens within gaming some of those are, um, uh, are decentralized digital tokens. You wanna to be able to carve up a piece of your crypto asset portfolio as part of your broader portfolio mix into GameFi, then using uh, a taxonomy like the taxonomy that we have in partnership with Wilshire can help you uh, really quickly identify thematically, here are the assets that you know, meet that use case and can help you build that diversified portfolio. I think it's just just the same as in equities. I want to allocate to equities, but I may be um, of, a, of a conviction that you know energy stocks are are going to be 
you know, outperforming in the next um, two years. And so I want to overweight my portfolio or I want to make sure I have that exposure. And so this, this can give you a kind of similar tool within the crypto asset space. And I'd be remiss if I didn't say, you know, we're tracking 10,000 assets, a bunch of which is DREC and, and not, um, not worth following. And so we do try to layer in on top of that uh, measures of quality. So you can look at the way you weight those assets and make sure from a risk weighted perspective, you're thinking about quality in that process. Yeah, and I appreciate you diving into that. And another thing that came across about in 2022 with everything that happened with centralized crypto entities like BlockFi, like FTX, Celsius, came the need for uh, asset or exchange vetting and due diligence. You know, that's something we preached from the very start, even before. And, you know, that wasn't the sexy thing to talk about. You know, a lot of people, you know, would hear us talk about that and like, well, that's not what I care about. I care, you know, NFTs are going to the moon. Everything's going to the moon that, you know, how are you going to get involved? And now all of a sudden, everybody wants to talk about risk management and due diligence. Um, so one of the most important things I think you've brought to the world is the uh, exchange vetting. So can you talk a little bit more about the due diligence and the vetting process that need to happen with these centralized entities? Yeah, absolutely. And so I, I again, come from a traditional finance background. And one of the things we always did as fiduciaries was make sure we understood and managed counterparty risk. And so even dealing with Morgan Stanley or Bank of New York or uh, those large venerable institutions, you do your diligence and make sure that you understood the risks that you were taking, were your assets really segregated, what controls did they have in place, what uh, was likely to happen to your assets in bankruptcy. A number of my peers in the hedge fund space got trapped in a Lehman bankruptcy. Fortunately, we were able to avoid that in the firm that I worked for by thinking about your counterparty risk and engaging with and keeping our assets with counterparties that we believed were more likely to survive the um, that financial crisis. Um, and I think the same thing is true in crypto assets. And in fact, the regulatory environment is just so much thinner, so much lighter that you have to be even more careful in crypto. We got started early on in um, in the history of DAR with uh, folks coming to us and saying, you know, we're institutional clients. We want to trade with these exchanges where we see liquidity, but is Binance a scam? We can't find enough information to understand. And so we started doing um, vetting of exchanges to understand whether they were uh, real economic engines that were matching real buyers and real sellers, or they were faking data, or they were allowing wash trading, or they had the right controls in place to prevent that in the, in the future. And, and you know, how does their business stack up as a counterparty? Um, and we have helped some of our clients think about the London Stock Exchange Group who said, we don't want to go into this and bear um, reputational and other risks by engaging with exchanges that are um, producing data that is um, clearly fraudulent and manipulated. If you read the Bitwise report from a few years back, they said 95% of the reported volume in Bitcoin is non-economic. And I think that you know is true, and we've seen you know some bad actors uh, in the centralized space. Look, the only way you can figure out the good from the bad is to vet these carefully. And and I'll say somewhat proudly, we got FTX right. We tried to engage them for um, uh, vetting on behalf of of some of our clients, and they said, "There's we're just not going to share with you this critical information." We pointed out a number of red flags and. Uh, to our knowledge, none of our clients had assets trapped on FTX. And so we're really excited to say, look, you know, we, we know that this kind of vetting is really important. And now we've kind of shown the way that this can be done. And we hope that the, the rest of the industry will, will kind of catch up and make sure that we don't have another round of, of bad actors um, in the vein of, of, um, uh, of FTX or, or some others we've seen. Yeah. And I think this goes into Matt, and you've heard the word get thrown around already on this webinar a couple of times, the word fiduciary. And a lot of people, I think, uh, don't understand really what that means. I think we throw that word around a lot, and there isn't really a clear definition that everyone uh, mutually defines uh, and can understand. Uh, so I hope this is giving insight to everyone on this webinar, or if you're listening to this on demand, uh, that 
this is what it means to do a lot of this behind the scenes work before you start doing things like what we do for uh, our clients. Um, and that's what it really means to be a fiduciary. Um, it doesn't just mean uh, to go out there with no process uh, to bringing this to clients. And we're going to get into a lot more themes, but I guess to recap this first one. So the future defining and segmenting of digital assets is going to be a huge theme for 2023. We're going to continue to separate the, the centralized crypto uh, industry versus the decentralized crypto industry. And then we're also going to define those sectors, subsectors, and then understand the guidelines that we'll need to be able to navigate both of those industries because both will exist. It's not an either or, and it, they will end up having to work in harmony, we think, down the line. So with that being said, I think it's important we now let's move on to the second uh, guiding theme, and that's where token tokenization versus tokenized assets um, or tokens. And that's where you're going to see these words, and they're going to be very confusing for the rest of 2023. And you're going to hear the word or the um, the acronym RWA, real world assets. And what the most important thing as you start navigating 2023 is to understand what is meant by what are tokens, what are tokenized and what are tokenized assets, or what is tokenizations. Uh, so Matt, I'm going to tap you in here for this second theme, which is tokens versus tokenized assets. And I'm going to I'm going to call back to when we initially launched and we did a roundtable event in early 2021. And if you haven't seen it, I encourage you to go watch it. It's on our YouTube channel um, where we say one of the number one investment theses of the reason why we want to get involved in digital assets is we see tokenization of assets as a huge value add. And so you talk about this idea of systems needing an upgrade. Tell us what you mean and tell us why this is going to be a theme in 2023. Yeah, so. One of the things that I firmly believe in is that it, all, all that we're talking about here is technology, right? We're talking about efficiencies born through technology. And if we look back over the last 20 years, and if you reflect personally how things have, how technology has impacted your life, right? Thinking back even 10 years ago, it's dramatic. And it happens a daily, so it's hard to notice from one day to the next, but over 10 years, it's it's dramatic, or 20 years, it's even more so. So when we talk about this asset class and what one of the first kind of true, I think, use cases is, is upgrading the current financial system, right? It's built on rails from the 60s and 70s. We still use these payment systems that, right, yesterday was a is Martin Luther King holiday in the United States. It was a non-settlement day, non-trading day, non-bank day. So now we have three days of no activity, right? <laughs> Which yet things in value are transferring around the world 24 7 3, 6, 5, and that's only accelerating so when i look at these this new asset class with all this underlying technology and the promises what i feel strongly about is we need to bring these real world assets mark you talked about our what our rwa on chain right where they are now can be traded in a new environment that has instant or near instant settlement three traded 24 7 365 globally and it can provide access for so many more people, which I, I think is what one of the promises of blockchain technology that gets people excited, right? It opens the doors for so many more people to be able to invest and to explore and to create wealth and to do other things that is still closed to this day in 2023. And so when I think about this idea of tokenization and tokenized assets, for me, it's like, let's bring on chain many real world assets and allow people to engage with them in new ways. And of course, we'll talk about regulation that needs to happen and things like that. But to me, that is a massive potential here. And then you can layer in the technology and what these smart contracts that Doug was talking about can do versus what the current financial system is. That's where I get, I get really excited. Wonderful. And Doug, I know you have a lot to talk about on this subject too. I'd love to tap you in here. Um, you've mentioned a, a few things um, and about using these new rails versus the traditional rails. So can you talk about why there's a need? Because I think one of the one of the things that is a criticism of this industry or these assets or this technology is that it is a technology that is in search of a problem rather than there is a problem that this is solving for, which obviously for us, we believe that that is not true. And I think uh, what I try to help open the minds of people, I can't change anybody's mind about things, but I can try to open their minds. Well, yes, in your world and in your view, 
you may not have this problem, but if you think about this on a global scale, there are so many problems that still need to be solved, even though in your world, it's not a problem. So I think that's been one of the biggest things. So can you talk a little bit about that, the old rails versus the new rails, and really that there are problems that do need to be solved? Yeah, when we think about um, problems in traditional finance, it is really easy to get caught up in. I don't have a problem because I got my um, debit card, my credit card, my bank account, and um, you know I'm able to pay my rent and everything works out great. Um, but that's not true for everyone, as you say, and you may not realize exactly what's happening behind the scenes that may be to your disadvantage. And so when we think about this as a technology that is programmable money that has lots of different features and so can be used in lots of different ways, we can start to solve some problems like cross-border payments, which can be hung up on the, the ability to get money in or out of a country, capital controls. It can be hung up on uh, things like bank holidays. It can be hung up uh, on, on things like um, the availability of um, uh, of the uh, receiver and you know where's the Western Union office that I can go to um, as people have smartphones and internet uh, the ability to reach people on a cross border basis gets a lot easier because of of crypto and what we need then are those on ramps and off ramps to be able to convert that crypto into uh, into fiat or into some usable uh, usable um, uh, space. And we look at companies like Ripple uh, or tokens like Ripple that have worked on solving that particular problem. When I think about the, the, um, the rails that our financial system runs on, there's, there's banking, there's capital markets, there are a number of different silos. And so payments is only one case. The, the one that um, we're most excited about with these real world assets is probably investment and capital markets. Capital markets rely on technology, uh, like was said from you know the '60s or maybe even before in some cases, or you know kind of a rolling um, uh, set of technologies that have been built over the years and have a lot of um, uh, inherent uh, flaws that you know can be uh, uh, solved with some of the technologies that we're talking about. For example, um, when I go to buy uh, stocks. There's a two-day settlement time. Used to be three days, used to be four days, but two-day settlement time until I can get the proceeds of that sale back and recycle my capital. And by the way, I'm going to pay uh, some middlemen in various ways, financing costs, uh, potentially transaction costs. There are a number of ways that, uh, that I may be um, paying a tax that's not obvious to me. Mm -hmm. And when some of our clients who are large institutional, we, we've done uh, some work with a couple of them, uh, have tried to measure the benefit that could be brought by using crypto trading infrastructure, that is three, um, uh, 24 by 7 by 365 trading, so I can constantly trade, um, the ability to do real-time or near real-time. Let's let's call it same-day settlement. Let's not even go to real-time. Let's say just to mm -hmm. settle in the same day so that I can recycle my capital so I can have immediately have the proceeds from that sale uh, or re, you know get the asset that I that I've purchased. Um, that may add 50 basis points or half a percent up to two percent to my my returns if I'm trading traditional assets and traditional meaning my share of Apple stock, um, perhaps uh, some tokenized real estate, perhaps some other types of assets. But when you think about that and you put that in the context of, you know, what's the long run average return on equity? Depends on who you ask, but maybe let's call it seven or 8%. What if you could add 2% to that return or even just 1% to that return because you weren't paying the financing and other transaction mm -hmm. costs in the middle? And so we're excited to, to see and I think, look, Bitcoin and crypto markets were a good proof of concept. When we can tokenize um, real world assets, we can start to see some of those efficiencies. And the good news is there are a number of companies working on that today who have made tremendous progress in the last couple of years. And we now have real um, 
real tokenized assets that are tradable and can start to fill in a portfolio and can start to be meaningful. And for several years, we all talked about it for maybe five years ago, we all talked about it. Too many regulatory headwinds, not enough um, activity in the space. And now we're starting to see that come to bear fruit. And so we're super excited about that. I would, yeah, but I, I jump in and add one thing that Doug, you talked about, and I think it's important when we talk about these use cases, you talk about counterparty risk, right? You and I both were in the industry, you were in the hedge fund side, I was in the RIA side, through the 2008, 2009 financial crisis and counterparty risk was a real thing. But just imagine, let's say, for instance, if the SEC had approved a lot of these protocols and said, hey, we can use these things. Imagine if everybody's assets were in a smart contract, auditable 24 7, 3, 6, 5. You know what they have. You know what their loan thresholds are. You know where their triggers are that's going to create a, a, a potential sale to pay off any certain loan. Imagine the transparency and accountability that is that can use this technology, but we're not there yet. I mean, that's where I think we need to get to and where we want to go. And Mark, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that. But I just wanted to mention that if you're thinking about how, what problem does this solve? And are we in search of a problem? I don't think so. They're staring us right in the face. We just need to create the infrastructure and the, the the regulatory framework and the technological infrastructure to execute on it. No, I'm glad you jumped in with that. And I think to, to recap this entire theme, right, tokens versus tokenized assets. And again, this is a not an either or. Uh, part of the thesis is that in the future, on the back end, we will be operating under this decentralized crypto infrastructure. And that's where we're going to this is going to dovetail real nice into the next theme. Uh, from And then on the front end, we will have a centralized front end because let's be real, safety, security, and a centralized front end is a benefit, is a net benefit to people because not everyone, and this is where you're going to see a lot of the uh, crypto evangelists go to war with people like us or people who are in the traditional world on self-custody. Not everyone, and I would say, I would, again, argue very vehemently that the general population will not take self-custody. In fact, they are not equipped to take self-custody of their assets from a safety and security standpoint. And that's the way we think about it from a fiduciary lens. Um, and that's what, what can we do to help? And that's what we're working towards. So really understanding that both are needed, tokens and tokenized assets, and that the back end, we again, part of the investment thesis is that the back end will up or operate under these decentralized uh, protocols or networks, and the front end may remain very similar to what you're experiencing now. And that's the ultimate goal, what's going to be worked towards. And that dovetails nicely into our third theme. And our third theme it, for 2023 is moving on from transactions and speculation to core infrastructure. And that's kind of what we've already been hinting at already. And the way I'd like to kick this off, and Matt, just try to keep it to two or three minutes if you can, uh, so that way we can get to the last one and get to some Q&A is uh, you have a unique experience of giving it of where you started. And we both started or worked at uh, Charles Schwab. It's a name that everyone knows. And there's a very unique story. So I'd love for you to kind of tell us in your own words, what do you see? Like, what's this move from transactions and speculation to core infrastructure, given your experience at Schwab? Can you tell us a little bit more? Yeah, I think in terms of the structures that we work with now, you're talking about like with Gemini and with Coinbase and, and things like that. So I, yeah, Mark Lynch, I work at Schwab. I started back in like right before the right before the tech bubble blew up back in 2000. So I went through that um, interesting time in the marketplace as well as the 2008 2009 financial crisis. But the way I see it playing out, Mark, and you kind of just alluded to this, right? It's you know I I understand the core crypto fundamentalists, like not your keys, not your crypto. But you're right, that's not appropriate for most people to be able to take care of that and do it in a secure and safe way. Um, and so when I see how this industry is going to continue to evolve, people are going to need and want people like fiduciaries that understand this asset class to get help in understanding what these what they're investing in. And, you know, we've seen so many, again, going back to 2022, like so many things just kind of go wrong with the wrong type of people involved, these hype people that are out there just trying to get assets on on whatever platform they're building. So when I think about what needs to happen is level-headedness, thoughtfulness, and people building the infrastructure in the right way. So I'm great. I'm so happy that we met Doug and his team because that, there's a lot of similarities here. We're head down. Let's keep building this. Let's keep doing this the right way without all of the hype and all the all the other stuff to truly realize the true value of this technology. 
Well, I think the and the biggest thing is that you know we've seen this industry grow based on revenues and uh, off of transactions and speculation versus adding value in many different areas. And that's I think you know from where you were at Schwab, you know Schwab. That's where Charles Schwab. A lot of people don't know that's where Charles Schwab started. They they purely made their business on trading fees and commissions, and they had to evolve. But you look at Schwab now, and it's evolved into what it is, and they generate value through not everything's free on Schwab now. They've completely pivoted. And that's where I think this theme is going to be similar to the crypto industry in 2023 and, and beyond, is you're going to see things move from just pure transactions and speculation to people are going to be talking more about core infrastructure, because there is a lot happening with core infrastructure that's being built. You know, we've seen BlackRock and all these big, big players. And I was, you know, we were talking to others that I think a lot of them are thankful for this because they see it as their catch up time. I was talking to someone over uh, at BlackRock and that's kind of how they're going about it is this is their time to catch up now. Um, and they didn't miss the boat. And I think you're going to see the same thing play out at all these other big firms who felt they missed it last year, but now they've been given this opportunity. So Doug, I'd like to kind of to hear what you talk, uh, hear your thoughts on this and this idea of core infrastructure. Um, so where do you see this happening? Where is it starting? What do you think uh, that people need to be paying attention to? Yeah, I think um, when we looked at crypto um, just a few years ago, there weren't any real um, use cases that were actionable. And I think we spent a lot of time talking to our clients who said, how do you do valuation when you can't do any sort of fundamental uh, analysis? You can't really measure anything like cash flows like we're used to in traditional assets. And we start to get now uh, enough activity where uh, you know, smart contract platforms, you can measure the economic benefit that comes out of those uh, smart contract transactions as a sort of proxy for cash flows and should be accruing value uh, to the network. Um, we're seeing a similar kind of flurry of activity in I think decentralized finance in, in um, ga the gaming space, in uh, probably a half a dozen sectors, it's a very meaningful amount of activity that is creating real economic value that is now infrastructure that, um, that people can start to use. Now, I think it's still early. I, I really kind of liken it to um, the, uh, the e-commerce uh, boom in the 90s. Uh, Matt, uh, the young guy, um, got his start a little bit after me, but I remember watching e-commerce in the kind of mid to late 90s, and you know it used to be really expensive to uh, set up an e-commerce site. You have to build it from scratch, a bunch of engineering talent. It might take you two years or a year to get it set up. And then there were some off-the-shelf tools that started to get built. We think we think about like the Lamp Stack, Linux, Apache. Et cetera, these, um, these tools that I could put together an e-commerce store in a matter of a few, first of all, started with a few months and then a few weeks, and it got down to where in a couple of hours I can have an e-commerce website up and running from scratch because all the building blocks are there. And those building blocks are increasingly being built in DeFi to allow us to do things like borrow and lend, uh, to do um, hedging, to do portfolio management, to do a number of things. And sort of, we see this infrastructure being deployed by um, institutional clients who want to be able to take open source battle-tested technology and drop it into their particular use case. And that can, you know, think about replacing the, um, the brittle systems that, that big banks have been using for 30, 40 years and that are such so expensive to maintain. And I think we start to see some of those same efficiencies come to finance that we saw with the internet. And I love the internet analogy just because old guys like me can kind of, you know, you can use that as a proxy and really kind of understand the, the amount of change that the internet ushered into our lives is massive here, um, you know, 30 years later. And I think in crypto, we're, you know, we're in for a similar amount of change um, over some time time frame, it'll take you know years for it all to play out. But uh, the interesting thing is we're, we we've seen real uh, real uh, progress being made in these last two years. 
Wonderful. Thank you for going into that. And I guess uh, to recap that theme of speculation and transactions to core infrastructure, you know, uh, a few things to put on people's radar, which you will see more come on, is the uh, dating computing sector. So Chainlink partnering with the international, set, international banking and settlements uh, for a proof of concept. That's core infrastructure that's being worked on. Uh, utilizing Ethereum as a base layer for it, or maybe even other at once. Or you're starting to see Google, who's piping into Mark froze up a little bit there. Doug, can you hear Mark? I can't. Looks like he froze to me. Looks like he did freeze up, yeah. We'll give him another few seconds and we'll carry on without him if he's uh, any. Uh, oh, Doug, you're the host now. So it looks like Mark just dropped. <laughs> All right. Um, we. Should we, we had, jump into the fourth? Uh, yeah. And, no, Mark's back. Oh, Mark, we're just getting ready to that, jump everybody. into. Yeah, go ahead. We're just getting ready to jump into the fourth uh, talking Wonderful. point. Wonderful. Wonderful. So the fourth talking point is going to be around regulation and laws uh, shaping the industry. There are so many things happening. Uh, so some of the biggest things happening in this space and area is a lot of the actions that you're seeing the SEC come come after uh, many centralized crypto entities as well as decentralized crypto entities. But the majority of the focus is going to be on the centralized crypto entities. Uh, so Matt, I'd love for you to talk a little bit about, because you're our chief compliance officer over at Arbor Capital and you have a unique lens here. Uh, what do you say, and you've said this uh, many, many times that a lot of the regulation we're going to get and that clarity everyone is looking for is going to get settled in the courts. And lo and behold, we're going to we're going to see that. So 2023 being shaped, what do you think happens? What what should people be paying attention to? Yeah, real quick. So right, anyway, this goes back to the Howey test, was which is the standard today for uh, security classification was right born by the courts, not the actual SEC. Um, I'll just comment on the pending case right now, right? We've got Gem Gemini and Genesis getting sued by the SEC. That's in th that's not a digital asset. That is a lending product between two companies. So unfortunately, we're not going to get it specifically to the, to the uh, digital asset protocols themselves. So if you're going to follow that lawsuit, which is great, that unfortunately is probably not going to give us what we want. I will say this. So uh, the way we look at it, right, is we invest in these. We, first of all, it goes back to the custodial level. Where where are these assets being stored, and who can do that in a safe and secure way? And so we have gone through our due diligence process. Clearly, never even considered FTX and some of these other ones, and uh, whether they consider themselves centralized or decentralized. The other point I want to make real quick is we're involved in an organization called Planner DAO, and they have gone through a due DeFi. Toolkit. So if you're an advisor and you actually wanting to work with people that have on-chain assets, you can get in that group and there's a resource there for a fiduciary to go through. And how do I do this in a compliant way from trading to charging, things like that. And so there's two different ways if you want. And what we do, though, is more on the SMA side. So I just want to make that clear. I'm hopeful, though, at some point we can get movement on what these are. The CFA Institute, Mark, you just referenced this paper that they published literally like a week ago. They talk about the need for regulatory clarity, whether or not crypto assets are securities needs to be determined instead of taking the blunt hammer from almost 70 years, 80 years ago and saying, we're just going to apply these things. Doug talked about some of the unique features of these potential assets of programmable money, even programmable securities, programmable assets. And so using rules and laws from 80 years ago, to me, doesn't make a lot of sense. The last point I made, regulation needs to be harmonized, not just across our own uh, regulatory bodies in the United States, but there's an international push for that starting to happen because these assets trade globally 24-7-365. Thank you. I'll leave it at uh, that. Matt. Yeah. Sorry, I want yeah. to be brief. Get those two points out. <laughs> there's so many things we can dive into here. And I yeah. think uh, uh, one thing I'd like to showcase here is that um, I think the two things that everyone's worried about, especially if you're an advisor, is uh, clarity on if what is an asset and what is not considered an asset? I think that's the first thing that people are going to be looking for. And unfortunately, I don't think we get that in 2023. However, mm -hmm. we we will get further clarity on how centralized players need to act. 
So I think you're going to see more licensing come out. I think you're going to see more uh, registration with governing entities. I think you're going to see, I think proof of reserves has been a hot topic in 2022. But Doug, I'd like, since you do a lot of the asset vetting or the exchange vetting uh, at Digital Asset Research, you guys have a unique view. And especially when we think about what we're going to get in 2023, do you see something similar playing out from a regulatory standpoint? What do you think uh, is coming down the pipe? Yeah, I would generally uh, agree with Matt. I think, you know, we're probably going to get more out of the courts than we are out of um, uh, the legislature, which is really, you know, one of the key problems right now in the U.S. is that the SEC and the CFTC don't have all the powers that they would need to really regulate the space in a comprehensive way. The, um, uh, the comprehensive regulation in Europe or a comprehensive regulation called MECA um, is going to be voted on here in April. And so we're probably going to see a better regulatory framework in Europe in the short term. We certainly have Gary Gensler, who is trying to take you know, as much turf as he can as a regulator. So he wants to put everything under his umbrella. And that may or may not work out for him. Um, but I think with a divided Congress, you know, we're probably not going to get some legislation that gives us perfect clarity, but we probably will get some reactions to certain things, uh, you know, maybe to uh, maybe to um, Terra Luna, maybe to FTX, uh, maybe to some other, uh, maybe some stablecoin regulation because of the uh, systemic risk that that could pose. So we may get some kind of bits and pieces, dribs and drabs, and then we're going to get some you know, activity in the courts that's going to be interesting. Grayscale is trying to, you know, figure out how to, um, you know, use the courts as a way to get a Bitcoin ETF uh, approved. I, I think, you know, this year will be a year of progress. We're not anticipating that there will be, you know, comprehensive progress like we all wish there was, because I think that sort of clarity will bring um, uh, institutional clients into the space, will help uh, the space mature, and uh, you know, it'd be just good to get behind us rather than the uncertainty that we're all faced with right now. Very well said. And uh, I'd like to round everything out. Um, so we've gone over a lot. And the if, to recap the four themes, again, defining and segmenting the industry, tokeniz tokens versus tokenized assets and tokenization. We have transactions and speculation to core infrastructure and laws and regulation through the courts. Uh, so those are our four themes. Uh, so what I'd like to do, so we do have some questions in the Q&A, but we want to be respectful of everyone's time. We will want to reply to those individually through it. But if you have other questions, please submit to us uh, through the ways of getting in touch with us. So if you want to partner with us or if you have Q&A and want to get in touch, you know, go to our both of our websites. I have them here. Um, we will send this out to all the registrants, uh, the deck as well. Um, but I highly encourage you, if you are trying to make sense of what's going on and you want to work with people who do have that fiduciary relationship to make sure that they are doing everything in their power to understand and create actionable items, please don't hesitate to reach out. Uh, if that's one thing we're going to see happen in 2023, we're going to see this consolidation from money grabbing, from greedy, from people wanting to just ride the wagon or get in to the people who have been in here for the right reasons for a little bit longer. So I think that's gonna be kind of our ad hoc theme is this idea of consolidation. Uh, so while you may see many names in a certain segment or area, it's probably gonna be whittled down at least by half uh, to see who's gonna actually survive and thrive. And as always, we, we wanna be there for that. And that's what we're driving towards and that's what we're building for. So with that, uh, Doug, Matt, are there any parting words you have for everyone as they navigate 2023? I'd say just, you know, continue to keep an open mind and think about, again, going back, because it's super important, all of the press around these centralized entities is not necessarily the technology itself that's under an indictment and investigation. It's just bad actors in the space. Yeah, I think this is going to be a really interesting year to build. We've got the, you know, the next Bitcoin halving coming in 2024. And as we see more clarity on the regulatory front, we see these protocols prove their use case. Um, that's where you're going to start to see um, events that are catalysts that that drive that upside. And so I think this is an interesting year to really look at your digital asset portfolio and position it for the growth that is coming. 
Very well said. Well, Doug, Matt, I want to say thank you for joining me today to talk about what we're going to see here and what we're going to look for in 2023. To everyone who joined us, again, we are so thankful for you, your participation, and for all the trust you put in us. Um, if you want to get in touch with us or ask us questions, again, you have our information here on the screen. We're also live on LinkedIn, Twitter, and all of those normal places. Uh, we are open to any and all conversations, but good luck out there. Uh, we are here to be trusted partners if you need, um, and we will hopefully be seeing you on the next webinar that we do. Cheers, everybody. We appreciate you listening to this edition of the Asset Revolution Podcast. I'm your host, Mark Nichols. Please don't forget to let us know how you like the show by rating and reviewing us on Apple Podcasts or wherever you like to listen. For more downloadable digital asset resources and educational opportunities, please visit us at arbordigital.io. We are here to help you get off zero safely and securely. Thanks again for tuning in and be sure to tell someone you care about them. Cheers. financial advisor. Unless you're under contract with or actively speaking with Arbor Capital Management or Arbor Digital, a division of Arbor Capital Management. This podcast is just that, a podcast. It is not financial, legal, or tax advice. If you have individual questions, please reach out.